So I'm really happy to introduce Mike Mose, who's an internationally renowned macro photographer, who's a pro at this and has exquisite photography. He's been published and written articles for over 15 years. He has a macro online club that has over 2,200 members and from countries all over the world. So thanks for coming tonight to our event and speaking to us and, and uh, I'll turn this over to you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I was still muted. <laughs> All right, you see that first slide with me and my name? Okay. All right, so I'm going to start off with the equipment that I use. And some of you may know a, of a photographer named Bill Fortney. He's been around for 40 years, worked for Nikon for about 10 years. And I ran into Bill at a photo conference that I was speaking at. And uh, Bill said, he says, Mike, he says, I know you're using our D7000 Nikon camera. He says, how come you're not using the pro cameras that we sell, the pro level bodies? And I says, well, Bill, I says about 60% of the people that come through my workshops are using cameras that are under $1,000. If I'm using your $6,500 camera, those people are going to leave my workshop saying, well, Mike's images look really good because he's got an expensive professional camera. Um, and those people that have those cameras under $1,000 will feel like they're not going to be able to get the same quality that I can get. Now, the camera that I'm using, uh, again, which was this D7000, I used that for nine years. And it last sold uh, when it was discontinued for $899. Now, I actually did upgrade to the 7500 D7500 Nikon um, last fall. And uh, that cameras only ran $899. So uh, it tells the people in my workshops that you don't have to have an expensive camera to produce top quality macro images. Now, I wouldn't tell you that this same camera would be good for someone that maybe shoots a lot of action shots or shoots in low light uh, with a high ISO. And But uh, we, don't, we don't require any of those things for macro photography. I can take a $500 entry level DSLR camera and produce top quality macro images. So whatever you own for a camera, you will do just fine. Uh, the lenses that I use, I am sponsored by Tamron. So I do use their 90 millimeter macro lens and their 18 to 400 zoom lens. And you can see the prices on those, 8 649 for both of those lenses. And then the tripod I use is a, is a Vanguard tripod. It runs 220. And then the ball head uh, I have is an Acrotec, which is 329. So all my equipment together runs out about 2746 if I added, right? <laughs> and that is uh, still a pretty good chunk of money to some people spending that kind of money for camera equipment. But you know that when you start looking at mid-size you know, bodies, uh, mid-grade bodies and up, and, and, and some of the more expensive lenses for Nikon and Canon, uh, even a Gitzo tripod, some of the really light stuff, ball heads, I mean, you can get into a lot more thousands of dollars than what I've got. So you don't have to have the most expensive gear to produce top quality macro images. <clears throat> the lenses that I use, uh, they come in short range, mid range and long range macro lenses. So these are the ones that are the most common that I see in my workshops. There are a few that are in between these numbers, but these are the ones that are I see on a regular basis in my workshops. So in the short focal length over to the left there, you'll see a 60. That's a 60 millimeter macro lens and Tamron, Nikon and Canon made those. Uh, Sigma was actually a 50 millimeter. So they had a 50 rather than a 60. So that would be the short focal length. Now in the mid range, uh, on the low end would be the Tamron 90 millimeter. And then you go to the 100, which is a Canon and the 105, which is Sigma and Nikon. Uh, telephoto macro lenses on the low end would be the 150 by Sigma and the 180, which has always been the most popular of the, of the telephoto macro lenses. Uh, the Tamron used to have one, but they've discontinued it. Sigma uh, also had one, and I believe they've discontinued it. So that would leave just Canon with the 180. And then, then the longest of the true macro lenses would be the 200 millimeter uh, from Nikon. Now, the other thing is, uh, Unfortunately, Tamron is no longer offering even the 90 millimeter, um, which is kind of strange, but uh, they're, they're going to stop and discontinue even the 90 millimeter. 
Now on the top right side, you'll see that image there. There's a short lens on the camera body. And I'm going to photograph this Rose of Sharon flower. Now I want to fill the frame with that flower. In order to do that, I've got to get as close as you see in order to get that shot. So the image that I photograph with that 60 millimeters on the upper left corner, and that is uh, again, a full frame shot of that image uh, with a, about a about a foot distance between the front of that lens and that flower. So you have to get in pretty close when you're using this, a short focal length macro lens. Now the next image below that, you see a little longer lens on, on the camera body. That's the 90 millimeter Tamron. Um, in order to get the exact same framing like I did with that 60 millimeter, I have to back away from that flower to get the same framing. And this is what we call working distance. So I've gained some working distance between me and that subject as I go to the longer focal length macro lens. Image on the bottom, that's a 180 macro lens. That's the telephoto macro. And you can see how far I am away from that flower now to get the exact same framing like I did with the 60 millimeter. So why is that important? Well, that uh, flower, let's say that flower was a, a dragonfly or a butterfly, probably wouldn't be too happy if I'm using a 60 millimeter and I'm a foot away from his face. But if I was using a telephoto lens like the 180 you see on the bottom, uh, I've got a great amount of working distance between me and that subject. So much greater chance for a live subject to stay there and not take off. So for People that shoot a lot of live subjects, usually the longer telephoto macro lenses are better because of that extra working distance. Now, I would say that probably 80, 85% of the people that come into my workshops are using uh, lenses that are in that mid range. They're using the 90s, the 100s, the 105s. And the reason why those people end up in that range is because of the price range. So when you get into those telephoto macro lenses, you're going to be up in the $1,300, $1,500 price range. And so a lot of people say, well, I don't want to spend that much money on a macro lens. But you can get into a mid range lens. You know, in the $600 to $800 price range. So that's a little bit more reasonable for most people to spend. And so that's why we see most people in my workshops are in that mid range uh, area. And it works fine. I mean, I use a 90 millimeter and it works, works just fine. Now, what's been really nice the last few years is lens companies that are coming out with zoom lenses that say they have macro capabilities. All right. So this 18 to 400 Tamron is the one that I use most of the time right now. Um, I probably would say that I use this 90% uh, of the time. Now, what I like about the 18 to 400 is that if I want to show an environmental shot of me out there shooting in, say, this swamp here, photographing leaves floating on the water, um, I can set up that lens on another camera body on another tripod, set my self timer and catch myself out there photographing in the swamp so I can show you the environment with that 18 millimeters on that lens. Now, if I'm in that same swamp and there's some frogs, you know, poking their heads out of the duckweed, I've got 400 millimeters that I can reach out so I can capture subjects at a distance from where I'm standing. It's also really good for um, when you're in botanical gardens. So I was in one yesterday shooting. And uh, when you have that long range where you can reach out, uh, you can capture subjects that are a distance from the pathway that I have to stay on. And I can't get in close to those subjects. Now with the 18 to 400, like I said, some of these lenses that are being produced nowadays will actually say they have some macro capability. Um, so you can photograph into a pretty small area. So this 18 to 400 will capture an area as small as an inch and a half by two and a half inches. I would say 90% of what I photograph is larger areas than an inch and a half by two and a half inches. So you don't, um, you know, have to carry, uh, you know, if you're going to do close up photography and you're going to shoot larger areas, you can get by with these zoom lenses and, and still have an 18 millimeter for any landscapes you want to do 400 if you need to reach out. And then we want to get into really close in, in tight on a subject, you can do that with that 18 to 400. Now this 18 to 400 is only for crop sensor by bodies. So let's say you have a full frame sensor camera, you'll want to go with the 28 to 300 from Tamron. Uh, that would be that would be the uh, lens that's designed for the full frame, but this 18 to 400 is just for the crop sensor body. 
if I need to get into that really small areas, you know, really tiny areas, then I can pull out my 90 millimeter macro lens and I can photograph inside this little pocket watch. So of course I couldn't do that with my 18 to 400, uh, just the lens alone, but with the Tamron 90 macro lens, I can get into a much smaller area. So uh, those two lenses are all I carry. Um, and, and even combined, they only run about $1,300 between the two lenses combined. So it's, it's a pretty economical set of lenses. Now, the tripod I use is made by a company called Vanguard. And the latest uh, version that they have out is called the VEO3+. Plus. Now, what's nice about the Vanguard tripod is it has a center post that will rise straight up and then it'll go into a horizontal position like you see here. And that's really good for macro and we need to get out over top of subjects to photograph them. Now Manfrotto has had a tripod that does this for many, many years. It'll have a center post that'll go up and rise up and go into a horizontal position. But the problem with the Manfrotto is that if I now wanted to say take this camera lens and, and move it closer to the subject, I would have to do it with all three of the legs. So I'd have to move the legs up and down. Uh, but with the Vanguard tripod, this center post here will actually pivot up and down so that I can move the camera closer or farther away from the subject. So that's what makes that Vanguard really nice. Um, you could get the camera away from the tripod body like you see here, so it's out of your way. And also the legs will go straight out on this tripod and you can literally put the base directly onto the ground, uh, bring the uh, center post out, and you can put the camera as low as you need to go on the ground. Uh, so excellent, excellent tripod for macro photography. And it only runs uh, about 220, I think it is. Uh, so it's, it's again, uh, there's so many tripods that are way more expensive than that. So it's, it does a lot for the macro photographer. And of course, it's good for any type of photography. It can also, uh, one of the legs can actually unscrew right from the tripod, and then you can put your head on top of this monopod, so it can turn into a monopod. So let's say you go to a botanical garden, they tell you, you can't bring your tripod in, you can unscrew one of the legs, put the head on top of it, and you got yourself a monopod, so that's pretty cool. Now, most of you probably have ball heads that you use, and a ball head has the um, big heavy metal housing that supports that ball on the top. And then there's this little U slot right in the front here. Now that U slot is where we maneuver the camera down into, you know, to, to shoot towards the ground, which we do a lot of times. So, you know, landscape wildlife photographers very rarely use the U slot because they're always shooting straight ahead. But with macro, we shoot down towards the ground many times at subjects. So we work within that little U slot there. So it can, you know, be a little bit of an inconvenience having to work within that U slot and then maybe pivoting the ball head back and forth to get your cam in, into position. The head that I'm using is by Acratech, A-C-R-A-T-E-C-H. That's called the ultimate ball head. Now you can see they've cut away all that big, heavy metal housing which makes this a very, very lightweight head. It's also made out of aluminum. So again, that also makes it very lightweight. Now, the key to this is this area in the front here, this 45 degrees has been cut away. So there's nothing in the foreground that is gonna get in my way when I need to move that camera down low or into positions or move the camera around to get my framing. Um, so I don't have to work in a use slot. I have total free range of movement with the front end of that, that ball head. So this is an excellent head for macro photography. It's so easy to get your camera in position for framing your subjects. So it's a little bit pricey. It runs about $329. Um, again, there's heads that are much more expensive than this one, and uh, obviously a lot of heads that are a lot less expensive. But if you do a lot of macro photography, you want to make your life a little easier, this is the head you want to get. Um, you can obviously do all the macro photography with the standard ball head. Um, this just makes your life a little bit easier. So it's a beautiful head. Now, as far as accessories, I don't cover all the accessories that uh, are, are used with our macro photography, but the most important accessory we definitely got to cover here tonight, and that's called the, the diffuser. Now, this is called a Dame's Rocket Flower, and you can see the top portion, the petals look pink, uh, but the problem is they're not pink. They're actually purple. Now, when you go out on a sunny day, maybe high noon, light's very harsh. And a lot of times that light will actually wash out colors on subjects. 
Uh, but this was actually photographed on a cloudy day. So you would wonder, on a cloudy day, you've got this beautiful uh, cover of clouds overhead like a giant diffuser. Why would you lose color? But you do, even on cloudy days, the intensity of the light and the, sh and the reflection from the clouds comes down. And when you have petals on flowers and subjects that are running parallel to the sky, you will actually lose some of that color on those subjects. So what you need to do is get yourself a 12 inch diffuser. This is the only size that I've ever used, 12 inches wide. Uh, they, they also come in 20 inches and 22 inches, but I've always used the 12. And what's nice, it'll actually fold down into itself to about four inches wide and can fit in your pocket. So that's what I like compact and it's cheap. You know, you can get them for maximum $15. A lot of times Hunt's Photo sells them for like 10 bucks. So once you put that uh, diffuser over top of that Dame's Rocket flower you just saw, it gets the color back to the natural purple it's supposed to be. So you can see on the left side, that's no diffuser, the right side with the diffuser. And again, remember, this is a cloudy day when this is happening. So even on cloudy days, I have to make sure I have that diffuser with me so I can diffuse subjects that may be washed out from the clouds overhead. Now, on that same day, I was walking down a trail and I happened to see this little leaf right here. And I could see the top portion of the leaf had washed out. Now, you remember what I said? Running parallel to the sky, it'll, it'll get washed out. The front part of the leaf, as you can see, is, is 90 degrees because it's tilted down. It's 90 degrees to the sky and it retains its color. It's that top portion that's running parallel to the sky that washes out. Once I put the diffuser over, I can get the color back. Now it's not 100% back on the top like it is on the front of the leaf, but there's at least enough color there that in post-processing I can darken down that top part to match up with the front part. The image on the left, because it's gone white and there's no color there, I can't work with that. So uh, that diffuser is just so important. Now if it's a sunny day, let's say it's sunny, uh, I'm going to diffuse my subject 100% of the time. Hear that? 100% of the time, I'm going to diffuse that subject. And the reason being, there's three things that happens on a sunny day. One is it can wash out the colors, just like you see on a cloudy day. It can alter the color of the subject, and it can create shadows in areas that I might not want shadows. I just want a nice even tone of light. Now, the image on the left is a sumac branch. Now that's early morning sunlight hitting that sumac branch. Now what's happened to those leaves is they've gone to a yellow, uh, yellowish color in the leaf, which is uh, caused by that sunlight hitting it. It's altered the color of the leaf. Once I put the diffuser between the, the branch and the sunlight, you can see the image on the right side, that's the natural color of the leaf. So by using that diffuser, I have brought the color back to the natural color by blocking that sunlight. So again, sunny days, I'm diffusing 100% of the time, unless I'm using sunlight for special effect like backlighting. Obviously, I wouldn't uh, diffuse that. But uh, if, if this is subjects from overhead or from front hitting my subject, I'm going to diffuse it 100% of the time on, on sunny days. And on cloudy days, depending on the subject, depending on how it's angled to the sky. You may even use your diffuser when you're indoors. Now, uh, this is a little succulent here. It's got kind of a sheen to it. And uh, if the light hits it at the right angle, it'll create what we call little hot spots, little white spots on there where the sun is kind of creating a glare on the, on the glaze. Now, a lot of people will say, well, couldn't you use a, a, a polarizing filter? Um, and the problem is, is that those only work at certain angles to the light. They don't work 100% of the time. Diffusers work 100% of the time. So uh, stick with the diffuser uh, and, and it'll save you a lot of money because the polarizer costs a good ones can cost a couple hundred bucks. So a uh, 12 inch diffuser will work great for all this. Now you're thinking, do I have to hold this diffuser all the time? Well, you could if you wanted to, you could just hand hold it. But if you wanted to uh, have an assistant with you, you could buy this plamp here. Now the plamp has a big, large clamp on the left side, which can clamp onto the tripod leg. And then you have the flexible tubing on the other end, you've got a, another clamp that you can put your diffuser in there and clamp down on it. And that way that will hold your diffuser over top of your subject. 
Now, let's say you're using a long lens and you're back farther away from that subject, that flexible tubing may not be long enough to reach out and put that diffuser over your subject. So what Wimberley did, the manufacturer of the plant, they come up with a stake system. So now you can put the stake next to your subject, clamp onto the stake, and then the other end, as in this picture here, they actually showed it attached onto a stem of a flower so that in case it's windy out, you could steady the flower from moving back and forth or you could use it to hold your uh, diffuser over top of the flower. So that way you'd be free to take your tripod, move around, get your framing on your subject, and you don't have to worry about holding your diffuser. Now, this is my studio in my home, my photography studio. <clears throat> I built my house around my studio. <laughs> so the, you know, people always ask like, why would you photograph on your stairway? Well, because this is a two story high foyer and the front of the house has a big massive window up top on the second level and it floods that stairway with natural light. It's the best place in my house to photograph beautiful natural light. Uh, when I first started, I was actually set up with a table next to a, a door wall where there was a lot of light coming in or a window, uh, but it was more dire directional light coming from one side. Uh, in the stairway, the light seems to just kind of just wrap itself right around the subjects. It's really interesting how it works. So I do all my photographing on my stairway. Now, one thing about photographing flowers is that you need a background behind your subject because obviously I don't want stairs as my background behind my subject. So I have to put something behind there. Now in the beginning when I first started I was using black fleece and I was using white backgrounds and so all my flower photography was coming out with white and black backgrounds and it's okay but it doesn't look natural to me. I wanted a I wanted a background that was like a natural background like I shot those tulips there out in 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 nature somewhere where there was maybe grass back there that I had blurred out. So what I did is I went out to one of the local parks and I set up my tripod. I'm using my 90 millimeter Tamron lens, my macro lens. As I would recommend a macro lens if you have it for this, this uh, thing I'm going to show you here. And I've focused on the subject. So I manually focus so you can see the grass, what it looks like. Now, you know that when you're manually focusing, if you take that focusing ring and you kind of rotate it to the left or to the right of the focus point, it starts to go soft and out of focus. So what you want to do is take that focusing ring and rotate it you know, way to the left and then go way to the right. Now, one of the two ways, either the left or the right, it's going to take that subject right there completely out of focus to a solid blur, just a solid color. And when you get it to that solid color, you photograph it and you end up with that right there. So that grass with the manual focus ring rotated on my lens all the way to the right side, just keep rotating, rotating, it'll go to a solid color. And when it gets there, I can photograph it and end up with a natural green from nature that I can print on a, a, a matte paper. Don't use any glossy papers or any semi-gloss, use it on a matte paper. And then you can put that behind your subjects and it can look just like you photographed it out uh, doors and you blurred out the grass in the background. Now, let's say that you're looking at that and you go, well, I'd like a little bit of texture left in there. So uh, this is another subject when I'm taking the focusing ring and rotating it to the right. I just don't take it all the way to where it's where it's a solid color. I leave a little bit of texture in there and you photograph it and then you get something like that where you get a little bit of blotchiness kind of in there. And maybe you think that looks more natural than just a solid color. But I'll show you images in a little bit where I photograph subjects out in nature and got that same exact solid color green behind my subject just naturally. Uh, let's say you're shooting a field with some little yellow flowers. Uh, you're going to get more of a yellowish green. If you're shooting with some pink flowers in your subjects, then you're going to get some pinks in there. So when you go to botanical gardens where you have large plots of colorful flowers, you go in there and you just set up, take your lens out of focus, and you're going to have uh, different shades of colors that you can use as backgrounds when you're shooting indoors. And it works just great. Now, when I ask macro photographers, what are you struggling with? What, what is your problem that you're either you're having with, um, uh, you know, depth of field? And, and that's always the biggest struggle that macro photographers, you know, 
have to have to learn how to do and understand a little bit is the depth of field when we're in really close to subjects. Now, uh, with landscape and wildlife photographers, they get great amounts of depth of field, even at smaller f stops. But with macro photography, when we move in super close to our subject, the depth of field shrinks down to almost nothing sometimes. So it can be a little bit difficult to work with until you understand it a little well better. Now, the image on the left side, that is a uh, a real popular style among macro photographers, we call it soft focus flower photography. So we're getting very little in focus. So you can see here, just this little stamen thing popping out of the center uh, is all that's in focus. And you can see the softness around it and all the way into the background. That is done with the smallest f-stops on your lens. So your lens, maybe it goes to 2.8, maybe 3.5, whatever the smallest f-stop. Uh, you wanna shoot at those small f-stops to get this soft focus style like you see here. Now the image on the right side, that's a, that's a large agave and, and that's all in focus, top to bottom, side to side, front to back. And that's done with the highest f-stop. So if I want maximum depth of field, I'm going to the largest numbers. I'm up in the f32 range or 22, depending on your macro lens. So this is another example of soft focus flower photography. It's a trillium flower and I've used a, a 180 macro lens at 3.5 smallest f-stop. All I have is the very edge of this petal uh, is in focus. And you can see the, the softness that you get at that small f-stop, it just blurs into the flower and, and goes into a solid color in the background. Here's another one, Dragonfly, just focused on his face. And with that small f-stop number, you can see the softness in the body and the wings. And you can see how the grass in the background is just a solid blur. Here's a uh, goat's beard seed head. And all I did was focus right on this little stem right in here. Very, very little in focus at 2.8 on the 90 millimeter macro lens. And then you get that really nice, soft, kind of a dream-like look in the flowers. Now this is a, again, a very popular style. You'll see like uh, was mentioned early, Ann Belmont, uh, Jackie Kramer, uh, Kathleen Clemens, uh, Jerry Jones, they all do the lens babies and they use that soft focus look. And they're very, very, you know, popular style that a lot of people seem to like. Now, I actually like the other style of everything in focus. I'm more of an everything in focus type photographer. So this is a nice rose uh, that I photographed with, uh, again, top to bottom, side to side, front to back, all in focus, shot at the highest f-stops, f32. Um, this is a, uh, another agave, again, a lot of depth in this, probably about 18 inches from front to back in order to get it all in focus, f32. And this little frog, he was shot at F32. Now, interesting, I, said, I had an article that was published in Outdoor Photographer a couple of years ago, and I had, uh, I had entered this image with the article. And the editor emailed me and he said, the, the frog shot, he says, you've got it listed at F32. Is that correct? Or did you make a mistake? I says, no, that's that's F, what I shot it at, F32. I says, you have the file there. I says, go ahead and look at the file and you'll see the data and it'll tell you. So he emailed me back about uh, an hour later and he says, you know what? You're right. I looked at the file. It says F32. He says, I just never heard anybody shooting that high of an F-stop. I says, I do it all the time because I, I need to get a lot of depth of field. So this is uh, kind of an example of what I'm talking about with this depth of field with the small f-stop and the large f-stops. Now, this is a ruler I set up and you can see the, the Tamron 90 lens, the front of the lens is kind of at an angle to that ruler. In other words, it's not parallel over top of it, it's on an angle because there's gonna be times when you're shooting subject that you can't always get parallel to the subject. You've got to shoot on angles. And so you have to learn how to do that and what f-stops to choose to get it done if you want to get that all in focus. So when I shot this, I shot it at the 2.8. So you can see on the left side here, only one eighth, one little eighth of an inch in focus at that 2.8 when you're in that close on that angle. You can see just this little line outside here and outside of that eighth, it's already starting to go soft. And then of course, as it goes to the outer edges, it goes to almost a solid blur eventually. Now over on the right side, you see that's the F32 and you can see it's all in focus. That's about what, two, three inches of focus on that ruler that it's all in. Now it's a little bit slightly soft down at the very outer edges here, but uh, you know that's nothing that can't be sharpened and fixed in Photoshop. This is a spruce cone that I hung four feet in front of the spruce tree. So remember that spruce trees four feet behind the cone. 
Now I'm shooting with a 180 macro lens and I have uh, the front of the lens parallel with the flat part of the cone right here. And I shot this first shot at 3.5, smallest f-stop. And as you remember, very little in focus at 3.5. So what happened was the flat part of the cone here, which is parallel with the front of the lens is in focus, but down here where that cone just slightly dips down to the tip, it's already out of focus down here. And then these needles that are in the foreground are out of focus too. So, um, we're only getting a portion of the, the subject in focus, uh, the flat part of the cone, but 3.5 doesn't have enough depth of field to reach back to four feet and pull in any details from that tree back there. It basically turned it into a solid blur. And that's good because we like to have that nice clean background behind our subject. We don't want a lot of clutter back there because it takes away from our main subject. The problem is, is uh, I'm not getting my subject in focus at 3.5. So if I want to get more depth of field on the subject, I got to go to the higher f-stop numbers. So let's, let's go from 3.5, we're going to go to f8. So now we're at f8. f8 now gives me enough depth of field to get this part of the cone all in focus and a little better focus here, but not totally sharp yet. And look what happens at four feet behind the cone now. F8 is reaching back and starting to pull in some of the details from those needles in that, that uh, spruce tree at four feet behind the cone. And it's not real bad. I mean, it's not, not super bad and, and, and detailed, but there is you know starting to get some clutter back there. So now if I wanna get the rest of the subject in focus, in other words, the needles in the foreground here in focus, I'm gonna to have to go to a higher f-stop. Now, if I go to f-16, just double that number. Now I get the whole subject completely tack sharp in focus, but look what happens to my background. F-16 has enough reach now to go back four feet and pull in details, more details on those needles. And now it's getting to be cluttered back there. So what we're trying to accomplish with macro photography is trying to get the subject over here all in focus like you see here, but we want that nice clean blurred background. All right, so it's actually very easy to do. It's not that hard. So these are images that I shot in the field uh, where I have a fully focused subject and I have a clean background behind it. That's a jewel weed with some dew drops and, and a little leaf there and a couple little stems. And you can see it's all in focus with a nice clean background. You remember when I shot that earlier one of the grass blurted out? I says, that's the same green that I get when I'm shooting out in nature and I blur out grass behind my subject. And here's another nice flower shot with another clean background behind it, all in focus. And critter portraits. We want our critters to be in focus and we want those backgrounds to still be clean. So got a nice uh, snail here all in focus, nice clean background. And a little hoverfly on a knapweed flower, again, all in focus, nice clean background. And a dewy covered dragonfly on a dying purple comb flower with a, actually it was a pond in the background that I blurred out. So nice blue color in the background. So as you can see, it's, you, it, it can be done. You can get your subject all in focus and still get a nice clean background. So this is what we don't want. We don't want that clutter back there. Uh, it takes away from our subject. We want a nice clean background behind it. And this is how you do it. It's real simple. This is what I call the key to flower and critter portraits. So we need to find the right subject. In other words, I'm looking for a subject that is isolated away from as much clutter as possible. And then we need to find the camera angle to that subject, which may change depending on where the background is behind that subject. And we want that background to be as far away as possible. And the farther away that background moves from your subject behind it, the higher the f-stop can go. Okay, so let's go back to that depth of field 3.5 with the uh, spruce comb. And you remember at 3.5, I says, look, we can blur out that background uh, with the 3.5 at four feet, uh, but we weren't getting enough depth of field on the main subject. So when we went to the, uh, the F8, we were getting more depth of field on our subject, but we were also bringing in that some of that background at four feet. Now let's say that we found another camera angle to photograph this same cone, but now there's a spruce tree that's 10 feet behind the cone. 
Now at 10 feet behind the cone, F8 won't have enough depth of field to reach back and pull in any details. So it would just blur out. Now let's say that uh, we wanted to go to F16 to get it all in focus, but now again at four feet, we, we brought in all those needles, but let's say we found a different angle to photograph this subject at with the background now is 20 feet behind the cone. If that background's 20 feet, F16 probably won't have enough depth of field to reach back to 20 feet and pull in any details. So that's the key to this. You have to find subjects that are isolated with backgrounds far away so that you can get into those higher F stops so, and, and still maintain that blurred background. So if you remember that uh, Dame's Rocket Flower I showed you earlier in the program where it was washed out, it was uh, kind of a pinkish color, but they were supposed to be purple. This is where I shot it. This is the day that I shot it. It was a cloudy day. Now, when you're going to photograph subjects like the Dame's Rocket here, you can see they are, they are growing in a large cluttered area here. It's very cluttered. So if you were going to try to photograph any one of these single stems here with flowers on it, uh, your background is literally inches behind the subject. That's not going to work for you, okay? So what you do when you get into these big cluttered areas, you go to the outside perimeters, and you'll generally find one or two flowers out here that are growing by themselves, all right? Now, this is the one right here is the one that I chose to photograph, and there it is right there. Now, you can see it's isolated away from all the clutter, and there's nothing behind it but that wooded area that you see in the background, that wooded area is about 15 feet behind that flower. So when I photograph that flower, I can get up into the F11s to F16s and get that flower in focus with the blurred background. So you can see this is not complicated stuff. It's actually pretty simple. Now here's a bladder campion flower and it's growing in all this tall grass. And of course, you're not gonna photograph that because again, where's the background? Well, right directly behind it. But where this grass is growing, it's tall grass, and that same flower, the species grew right straight through the grass, and it's way up here now, way up above the grass. And you can see there's nothing behind this flower but that wooded area, and that wooded area is probably 20 feet behind it. Uh, so we could photograph these, this pair here, or maybe photograph this one over here. And so you get that. So you can get into those higher F stops, get the flower and all in fo focus and still maintain that uh, that green background from the from the wooded area behind it. So it's just a matter of finding isolated subjects with backgrounds off in a distance. Now here we are in another situation that you're going to run into. You're going to want to shoot these oxide daisies, these little white flowers right here. And what you're finding is that every single oxide daisy is in all this tall grass and all this clutter. So there's really not one flower there that you can photograph where you're going to have a background that's going to be 10, 15, 20 feet behind the subject. So that's when you have to learn when to walk away. Sometimes it's just not going to work and you have to go and find another area to photograph and forget about that for that day, okay? Now there is an option here, okay? You can really still get that shot with a nice clean background behind it. And how you do that is, you know, those backgrounds I showed you how to make? The backgrounds that you're using indoors when you're shooting, well, you can take them outdoors and use them outdoors. So let's say you needed to get a shot of that oxide daisy. You just pull one of your backgrounds out of your backpack and you put it directly behind that flower, set your f-stop to whatever you want, and you can photograph that flower and get it all in focus and you'll have a nice clean background that you've provided behind the flower. <clears throat> and those backgrounds, I, I'll tell you right now, you would not know whether it was a background or if it was a natural shot with the blurred background naturally, uh, if I showed you an image. So um, that would be your option in cluttered conditions where you, you cannot get um, you know, a, a background far enough away from that, sh that flower. Now, this works really well in botanical gardens. So I was in a botanical garden yesterday called Boke. Uh, Boke Towers Gard, uh, Gardens, a beautiful place to shoot. And there was a lot of flowers there. And because flowers in botanical gardens are, are in packed with other things and they're cluttered, you just really can't find a flower that you're going to shoot with a background off in a distance in a botanical garden. So that's where I use all my backgrounds to shoot uh, in the botanical gardens. And they work really well for that. Now, in the springtime in Michigan, uh, and also in your area too, you get 
woodland flowers in the woods that are starting to come out. You can see this is early spring. The leaves haven't even come out much on the trees yet. Um, <laughs> these are lily of the valley and you can see how low they are to the ground. They're very difficult to shoot because they don't grow very tall. And the problem is because they are so low to the ground and they're all so cluttered together, you cannot really find uh, the flower group of flowers you wanna shoot with the background a distance away. So what I do is I put my background behind it, as you can see here. And you remember the plant that I showed you earlier to hold your diffuser? Well, guess what? Now the plant's holding my background behind my my subject I'm going to shoot. So I just stake it in the ground, clamp onto it, and use the other end to clamp onto my background so that I can have a clean background. So that subject I was shooting is this flower right here. And all I needed was this little area up in here to fill in with that nice clean background. Um, otherwise, I'd have uh, a clutter of leaves and other things in the background fill in that area back there. So this is much better. Give yourself options when you're shooting multiple f-stops. Don't just shoot one f-stop and get home and then be disappointed. Um, shoot, shoot four or five different f-stops. Uh, if you get home and you only have that one f-stop and you don't like what you see, maybe you're going to think, well, it's, it's not enough depth of field or it's too much depth of field, depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, you may not be able to go back and reshoot that subject, and it may not even be there when you go back to reshoot. So you want to set up shoot at least four to five different f-stops and that way when you get home you have some options to pick from i do this all the time because like i say sometimes you can't always tell by your little screen on your lcd you know how much depth of field you're getting on your subject as easily so just go ahead and shoot four or five f-stops so this is an example of what i'm talking about i have positioned a, a two calla lilies here, one directly in front of the other. And I have focused on this area right in here. Uh, I'm using the smallest f-stop. It was a 2.8 on the 90 millimeter macro lens. And you can see it softens down the front part of this front flower. And then the background, you can see it softens it down into a nice blur. So then the next f-stop I shoot is the f8. Now, when I say shoot multiple f-stops, I don't mean ones that are right next to each other because you wouldn't see much difference. You need to skip a few f-stops. So I went from 2.8 and I went up to f8. And so now you can see a little more detail coming in because we're getting a little more depth of field here. And then I went to F11 and a little more detail coming on that front flower, same as on the back flower. Then I went to F16, more detail coming in. And then F22 pretty much got most everything in focus at F22. So now I can go back and look at these five different F-stops and decide, do I want everything in focus? Do I want a little bit of softness on the back flower, just a little bit at the F16, or do I want to go to F11, get a little bit some more softness, or F8, or do I want maximum softness at the 2.8? So at least I have those five options that I can choose from, and then uh, you know keep one, toss out the other four if I need. But when you go into the field or anytime you go out to shoot, shoot at least four or five different f-stops, and that way you've got options when you get home to to look at. All right, now the image on the left side here, that's a pair of sunflowers that I had purchased at a, at a local farmer's market. And I had just brought them home, set them on the floor in my foyer, laid one kind of on top of the other one. And there's a lot of depth in this subject uh, because these, these flowers are very large. And when you put one on top of the other and you're shooting at the angle that I was shooting, uh, there's a lot of depth from the very bottom of the flower that you see all the way to the top portion. Now, as you can see, it's nice and sharp and uh, I have, use the f36 on my or f32 on my camera to get the maximum depth of field to get everything in focus now a lot of you out there are probably thinking right now well i've always been told i should never shoot over f16 because it causes diffraction now uh diffraction is something that happens inside the lens uh when you're shooting at a a, a lens that is shooting at the smallest f-stop the aperture inside the lens is 
is open to a very wide, big opening inside that lens. That would be 2.8. And then as we go into those higher f-stop numbers, that aperture inside starts to shrink down and shrink down and shrink down until we get to the f32. And now it's just a little small opening in that lens. Now, when you photograph that that sunflowers, that pair of sunflowers, the light from that you know the sunflowers that's coming through that lens is trying to squeeze through that little small opening inside in your aperture and as it's trying to squeeze through that little hole there it has a tendency to kind of move and, and bounce a little bit so that by the time it hits your sensor it, it's it causes a little bit of softness in the details of the subject you just shot now when i say it causes a little bit that's what i mean it's a slight slight softness it's not like your image is going to come out of, out of focus because a lot of people will scare people into thinking their images are going to come out completely out of focus and that's just not the case i've been doing this for 20 years and shooting at high f stops and it's never had an image come out blurry they just a slight softness in the fine details now the nice thing about digital photography is that every company that makes software whether it be Photoshop or Lightroom or uh, Nix software, Topaz, Smart Photo Editor, which I use for everything now, uh, they all have a sharpening program. And guess what sharpening programs are designed for? Sharpening your images, yeah. So that slight softness you get when you're shooting those high f-stops is corrected by the sharpening tools, just like you correct uh, you know, colors in your images, you correct contrast in your images, you correct exposure in your images. Why not cor correct any softness from the, the slight softness you get from diffraction? It's correctable, okay? I've been doing this for a long time. Look at my images on my website. They're all nice and tack sharp with everything in focus, okay? So it's, it's it, 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 can, it can be done and I've been doing it for a long time and it works excellent. Um, now that little picture on the right side that is a book all right very interesting because uh in 1930s ansel adams edward weston and there was five or six other photographers started their own camera club in california and they called that camera club group f64 and the philosophy of all the photographers, Ansel Adams, Edward Wesson, their philosophy was to get lenses that went to f64, and they shot all their images at that highest f-stop of the lens. So they were shooting at the highest f-stop of the lens, and they wanted the maximum depth of field to get everything in their subjects in focus. So here they were back in the 1930s, the most famous photographers of all times, shooting at F64. So this book is, uh, you can buy this on Amazon. I actually, someone turned me on to it. I purchased a very interesting story. It was this lady, Mary Street Ellender, uh, wrote the story of uh, how this camera club came about and about these different photographers. But uh, hey, if it's good enough shooting at F64, highest F-stop, Ansel Adams, it's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah, so um, don't be afraid of those big F-stops. But like I say, understand that if there is any slight softness, you may have to use a little sharpening to it. Now, I just did that workshop uh, a couple of weeks ago in Tucson, and, and uh, I had all my people shooting at the highest F-stop. And when we did our, our you know critique session at the end of the week, I was showing people on my laptop, look at that's image you shot at F32, and it's already sharp coming right out of the camera. The newer lenses that are being produced today for digital cameras are much better with diffraction than the old lenses. Now, a lot of these photographers nowadays still thinking back in the old days. We're not in the old days anymore. We have newer lenses, better lenses, and we have programs to correct it. So don't be afraid to shoot at the high f-stops. I have so many people tell me, oh, I never shoot over f16. Well, then you're missing out on a lot of depth of field for a lot of subjects. So. All right, gang, that's all I'm going to teach you today, but you can learn a heck of a lot more through my Macro Photo Club if you're interested. It has over 250 instructional videos that covers four categories. So there's post-processing, there's tips from the field, me out in the field actually shooting subjects and showing you how to do it. There's uh, uh, videos, there's like 50 videos on equipment. Um, and there's videos on post-processing, or did I say that? Oh, composition, that's the other one. Now, I have in three and a half years amassed 20, over 2,400 members from 27 countries. I was just blown away when I saw these people from other countries signing up for this. Uh, we also have a Facebook group, in which we have about 
almost 1200 of our members on the Facebook group, they, they share their images there and help each other. And we have a monthly theme that they can shoot um, and post on the uh, Facebook group. We also have 12 sponsors and the 12 sponsors uh, give away their products. So each month I get one product from a sponsor to, to raffle off to the members. Uh, and I mean, we've got lenses and tripods and heads and all kinds of stuff that we raffle off. Um, the membership is only a one-time fee of $99. You never have to pay again. You'll always have access to the videos. It's not like some of these other video clubs where you have to pay a monthly fee, $19.95, $29.95 a month, or a, a yearly fee. This is just a straight 99 bucks and you never have to pay again. So if you're interested, go to the website, which is tinylandscapes.com. As you see at the bottom there, and when you get to the website at the top, you'll see some links up there. And in, in the very middle, it'll say Macro Photo Club. Click on that, and it will take you through the information about the club and, and where to sign up. So, all right. So I'm willing to hang around and ask any answer any questions. If you want to uh, uh, ask any questions, I'd be happy to answer those for you. So if they want to put it in the chat box, or if you just want to turn your mics on and ask, that would be cool. Are you still there, Kathy? Yes, we do oh. have some. <laughs> I'm sorry. We do That's have right. some in the chat. Sure. Um, let's see. Let's... I see what kind of camera can you suggest? Any, any digital SLR or mirrorless cameras are good. And then what do you think of focus stacking to achieve blurred backgrounds? Um, a waste of time, <laughs> to put it bluntly. Um, I just did a blog post about that, focus stacking, waste of time. I just taught you how to do it with one shot. Why would you want to waste your time shooting 10, 12 images and then going through the process of merging together when you can get the same depth of field with the highest f-stops uh, and, and work your backgrounds off in a distance or put a background behind the subject? You can shoot one shot. I just don't see under, understand why people would want to shoot uh, multiple, multiple images and go through the hassle of having to merge them all together in a program when I can get the same results with one shot. Okay. And the other problem is if you're shooting outdoors, how many times do you get a day when there's literally no wind? No wind. Yeah. See, so see what Ken's doing. He's going like this. Yeah, exactly. So it's very difficult to do outdoors. Um, and I'm a nature photographer. So, but, uh, I, you know, I teach people how to get it done in one shot. So to me, it just it doesn't make sense to focus stack. Now here's where focus stacking comes in. And this is what it's more designed for. It's let's say you're shooting very high magnification. You're shooting a fly's head and filling the frame with the fly's head. That small, that tiny of a subject. All right. You're into three to one, four to one, five to one magnifications. If you think the depth of field at one to one is really small, the depth of field at five to one is almost nothing. All right. And that's where, where focus stacking comes in because you cannot get enough depth of field shooting even at the highest F stop to get that fly's head all in focus. So that's where, where focus stacking really is what it's all about is, is shooting very high magnifications where you need to get that depth of field. But for shooting close up photography, I can get anything in focus with the highest F stop. Uh, even like you saw those agaves that I was shooting there were, you know, 18 inches deep. So it's, it's just, to me, it seems like you would be wasting a lot of time trying to shoot uh, focus stacking for close-up photography when you can just get it done with one shot and a high f-stop number. How do you pick your uh, focus point? Um, I usually go in somewhere in the middle of the subject. Now you'll hear a landscape photographer say they shoot a one third into the scene because they say that they get more depth of field behind the focus point than in front. I have not noticed that to be true in macro photography. Um, I, I found that when I'm in the middle of the subject, I get as much in front as I do in the back and focus. So I usually uh, figure out somewhere in the middle uh, and, and focus there. Okay. What do you do to block the wind when you're, I know you use a diffuser for uh, even on a cloudy day, do you have a, another one of those circle things to block the wind as well? 
Um, I'll be honest with you. I don't go out and shoot when it's windy. <laughs> All right. The other tip I'll give you is that I'm an early riser. And so I'm out in the field at literally daybreak when the sun is barely over the coming over the horizon. And what you find at daybreak is you will get a lot of mornings where there'll be no wind or at least low wind okay at daybreak now as that sun gets up higher in the sky and starts moving that air then within an hour or so it's getting windy and i'm going home so basically everything i shoot is at daybreak to avoid as much wind as possible there is another thing that i actually designed is a clear plexiglass wind box that that surrounds the subject and if you go to youtube you type in mike moats wind box uh, there's a video there that shows you how to, to make that uh, plexiglass, clear plexiglass box, and it does work very well on windy days. Um, but I just go out at daybreak and shoot in the, in the morning for an hour or so until the wind starts to pick up and then I'm done for the day. Uh, if, and if I do get up at daybreak and there's wind out there, then I'm just not going to go out that day. It's just too much hassle dealing with the wind moving the subjects around. Um, so it's hard. And that's, that's what I was saying. You know, it's hard enough trying to get one shot of a subject sometimes, let alone get a, a series of shots doing focus stacking outside. Okay, thanks. Do you use uh, flash with soft boxes at all? Good question. I never use flash. None of my images have flash. They're all natural light. And that goes for indoors as well. Uh, I, I don't care where I'm at. I'm using only natural light. Never use any type of flash system. Uh, I do occasionally I'll use a little LED light to maybe add a little fill light somewhere in a subject. If I'm outdoors and maybe one part of the subject's kind of in the shade or something, I might add a little fill light in there. But that's even rare when that happens. Um, but yeah, I've never, ever used any flash systems, only whatever the natural light is that I'm shooting in. Can you repeat the information on the uh, tripod? Yeah, that's the Vanguard. Uh -huh. And the number is VEO3+. VEO3+. Okay. okay, thank you. Yep. They also have a new travel tripod, which is, is basically the same tripod, just an extra leg where they can collapse it down a little more. And that's called the VEO3. 3T plus T standing for travel. And that is an excellent little tripod. It's a little more compact for those that, that travel. Are your backgrounds on matte paper? Oh yeah. You know, it's a good thing you bring that up because I forgot to mention one other thing. Yeah. It's a matte paper. Um, no glossy papers because you don't want any sheen on there. And the other thing is important uh, that I forgot to mention is I was talking about using them in the field in botanical gardens. Well, you don't want to take them out there where you have this floppy print, right? That's flimsy. You have to back it with something. In other words, you want to use mat board, foam core, uh, uh, maybe cardboard even, anything to stiffen that print so it's not going to be flopping around. Now, what you want to do is get yourself some two-sided carpet tape two-sided carpet tape it has glue on both sides of the tape that way you can put the tape onto the backboard and then you can put your print right on top of it. it'll stick right to that backboard um, my my prints are eight and a half by 11 and it's only because the backpack i carry that's the the widest i can do is eight and a half uh, by 11 in length um, now if you have a larger backpack you could probably slide in some bigger prints in there but um yeah, smaller backpack, eight and a half by 11, but that's all I've ever used. And it works pretty well because I'm usually shooting single flowers. And so that eight and a half by 11 is, seems to be large enough to cover a background behind a subject. But if you could carry a little bit larger one, then that would be a good idea. But make sure you back those prints up with something because when, when you go to put them behind your subject, you don't want the print flopping around. And then you can use your plamp like you saw in, in that one picture. You can use your plamp to hold it for you behind your subject, or you can just hand hold it. Like most of the time I'm in botanical gardens, I'll just stand there and hand hold it behind the subject. The other thing with that plamp is, it, let's say that the subject is a little bit in from the edge of the walk that you're on and you can't walk in there, you got to stay on the walkway. Uh, and it's a little bit in farther than you can reach out. What you do is you take that plamp and you hold your hand on the clamp end of it. And then on the other end, you have your background uh, clamped on there. And then the plant becomes an, an extension of your arm so you can reach out farther to put it behind your subject. 
Um, I had to do that on one subject yesterday I was shooting and uh, I, I couldn't reach out and put it behind there. So I had to use the plamp on and put the, uh, the, the background in, into the end of the plamp and then use that plamp as an extension of my arm to get it out behind that subject. So that plamp has a lot of value when you're out there in the field shooting. There was a question about, have you tried gear? Heads How do you what? Have you tried gear, geared heads for macro? Oh, they're talking about a rail. Okay. Oh, oh, wait a minute. No, geared heads. Uh, okay. Well, the problem with the geared head is that, I mean, they're real precise. The problem is they're very slow. Um, and, and it takes a lot of maneuvering with different types of uh, controls to get that head to get into, or the camera to get into position you need to go into. Uh, you know, once you get in position, it's nice because you can kind of fine tune it back and forth for framing of that. Uh, but uh, it's a very slow working head. Uh, it's, it's, it's better using a ball header like the one I'm using. It's the best that I've found for macro for getting your camera into position really quickly. I asked that question, um, Mike. Okay. I actually Thanks, use a Ben Rowe head, and it has a um, a secondary lever on each of the knobs you can twist. So you, you can, can go faster. You can, yeah, you can manually yeah. just rotate. Okay. Just release the knob, and then you can use the uh, other knob to fine tune. Yeah, yeah. The ones that I've seen are real slow. Uh, yeah. They don't do what you're talking about. So yeah, if yours does that, then that's good. But they are really nice for fine tuning, though. That's for sure. Yeah. Do you use rails at all? Um, only for high magnification. And I, I, you know, a lot of people use it because it's called a focusing rail. So a lot of people use it for focusing. Uh, when they get in really, really close to a subject in high magnification, they'll actually just move the camera slightly back and forth for the focusing. But I actually use it more for framing my subject. When I'm really close to a subject, it's very difficult to move your tripod in a fraction or move it back a fraction. So I found that the rail works really well for just moving the camera forward or backward to get the framing that I want on the subject when I'm in super close to a small, tiny subject. Uh, but I, I, I hardly ever do any high magnification so it's very rare when I use it but uh, that's the only time I would use it it's it's not needed for close-up photography because you can literally just move the tripod back and forth to frame your subject do you use the uh, Raynox snap-ons at all no I've I mean I've seen them in my workshops and they're real nice and convenient because they just snap right on there but uh, uh, the only filter that I've used a close-up filter is the Nisi close-up filter and mm -hmm. uh, screws on the front of your lens and that's the only one i've used the uh is the is the nisi close-up filter but i've seen rainox and they do work pretty well um and they're easy they're nice they just clip right on the front of the lens real quick mike there's another question about what ISO you would use for oh, F32? That, yeah, that's a good question. Um, my camera will shoot at a fairly high ISO with low noise, so but I'm typically at a thousand, one thousand on the. Uh, but I can shoot at a thirty-two hundred and still get clean images because I've tested it up to that that number and it's been still pretty clean. Now I just got a hold of a um, Fuji because I've been trying some mirrorless. Uh, equipment and I got a hold of a Fuji XT30 Mark II. It's called. It's a mid-range camera. Runs about 900 bucks, so it's not an expensive one. But I talked to the rep from Fuji the other day because he was because I was confused on how to get it set up, and he was trying to help me. But I asked him about the ISO on that camera. I says, you know, how high can I shoot this thing? You know, without having to go through all the testing stuff and all that. What are you What are you telling me? He says, oh, you could easily shoot at you know 3,000 and get perfectly clean images actually he said a lot higher on that but um so i've been I, I was out shooting uh yesterday with that camera at at 2000 iso and getting really nice flat fast shutter speeds at those high f-stops uh and clean images i mean they had no problem with noise or anything at 2000 iso um, so and that's one thing people will say well you're shooting the f32 you're going to really slow down your shutter speed but most cameras nowadays you can get into the higher isos and, and quickly uh you know uh, boost that shutter speed up even at the highest is even the highest uh f-stops and uh i'm out 
usually there's plenty of light where I don't have any long exposures. If you were to see my videos that I've in my, my macro club, all my field videos, and I'm telling people, Hey, I'm shooting this at F32. And you hear the, hear the camera clicks. I haven't used a self timer. I mean, it's a really fast shutter speed. Uh, even when I was shooting at a thousand ISO. So it's not a problem shooting at high F stops outside. Uh, and, and again, all the cameras nowadays are, are able to shoot at higher F or higher ISOs and get still get good clean images out of them. Not like in the old days. I mean, geez, that first Fuji S2 camera I had back in 2004, you couldn't even shoot that thing at 400 ISO. I mean, the images come out all grainy. But every time in the next generation came up, the ISO got a little higher, a little higher, a little higher. And uh, now, geez, you talk to people that have got, you know, ISOs that go to 125,000 or some ridiculous amount. Um, so, yeah, we can shoot at a couple thousand ISOs, a lot of cameras, and still get really clean images out of them. So that really helps speed up my camera shooting at those higher f-stops. So. There have been several comments about um, that it was an amazing presentation. And Thanks. Yeah, Dennis said... Uh, as a new member of the club, it was amazing. Loved you. Don't love that you don't think photo stacking is needed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I still get people that'll say, "Oh, you're crazy." I'm going to focus stack. I don't care what you say. Well, that's fine. <laughs> do what you want to do. <laughs> Some presentation. Someone mentioned they're going to restart taking macro photos again. Yeah, it's so much fun. Yeah, yeah go to my website. You'll see uh, just tons of really cool images uh, in different categories. And it just gives you kind of some inspiration on all the different subject matter you can photograph. There's so much stuff out there to photograph. You see a lot of people just shoot flowers all the time, which are fine. But there's just this huge wealth of, of great subject matter plant life and all kinds of things to photograph out there so uh yeah go check it out and get some uh, ideas for different types of subject matter so you're not just shooting flowers and bugs all the time <laughs> mike did you put um anywhere on your slides your website yeah the last slide had tiny oh, yeah, landscapes okay, yeah tinylandscapes.com okay great Mike, there's a question again about the brand of the flexible tube. I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> oh, it, it's made it's made by Wimberly and it's called a plamp. P L A M P plamp. I was just going to ask about that. Have you tried using that to hold the stem of a flower? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's got the on, on the uh, the clamp system. It's got some foam in there so that when you're clamping the stem of the flower, it's not going to crush the stem. So the foam protects the stem. So they've came, you know, they, they knew that they, they didn't want to build something that's going to tear up a flower stem, you know, so they, they put foam in there. Uh, and then there's actually a little notch in there. So like when you're using a diffuser, the diffuser has that metal rim around the outside and it'll actually fit into that notch there so you can really secure it on there tight. It's a great tool. Yeah. I've got two in my Amazon cart right now. <laughs> yeah. And they're not expensive, you know. Uh, and get the get the stake too if they have it there because sometimes you're going to want to use the stake and clamp onto the stake. Yeah. Yeah, because even when it's not windy, I, you'll see the flowers just do the slow. Wind. Oh yeah, yeah. And and if it's windy enough, even though you may have stopped the stem, the petals can still move. So mm -hmm. there's a certain point where even even the plant's not going to help you if the petals are blowing around. So. Yeah. All right, gang, if that's it. Um, one more question. Mm -hmm. Dennis asked how much to do the Vulcan mind meld with you on macro photos. How much to what? How much you charge to do a Vulcan mind meld. I have no idea what that is. <laughs> he just wants to absorb everything that you want. Oh, oh, Vulcan mind melt. Oh, I get it. I think it's from Star Wars. Star, Star that went over my head too. I Star didn't Wars. <laughs> <laughs> oh, speaking of outer space, I was just at the Kennedy Space Museum at Cape Canaveral yesterday. I mean, that is amazing <laughs> seeing those big rockets. Uh, Guys, before we totally sign off, then I wanted to, Charles had put in here, Ella, come on. Charles had put in here, um, there's a photography exhibition by two photographers 
that's now at the Grange Insurance Autobahn. So it's down at Autobahn. Um, and it has 20 plus macro images of spiders, millipedes, and other multi leg chitin encased creatures. Some food Ooh, cool. <laughs> eating or being eaten. That sounds fun. <laughs> or yeah. just staring at you suspiciously from their faceted buggy eyes. A second photographer has 20 plus images showcasing Ohio raptors and hawks and owls and eagles and osprey. So anyway, um, you guys might be interested in that. I wanted to make sure if you didn't see that in the chat that you did see it. Charles is always on top of it. I love it. <laughs> One more thing before I go is that uh, I do have the macro photo conference that'll be in uh, Cleveland in October 1st and 2nd. And it's at the uh, Crown Plaza at the Cleveland airport. Uh, and we've got, there's five of us that'll be speaking. We've got over a hundred setups to photograph things. Uh, and it's just a blast. It's a Saturday and Sunday. Um, go to, if you go to my website, the tiny landscapes and you look at workshops on the top there, click that and you'll see on the first, uh, top part of the, the page, there'll be the information about the macro photo club. Uh, or I'm sorry, the macro photo conference. And it's, I, this is my eighth, eighth one that I've done. Um, they're just, they're a blast. Uh, so much fun. Uh, anytime you get together with a hundred macro photographers, uh, it's just a good time. And we've had the last one we did in Cleveland actually um, was uh, people from 23 different States and Canada. Uh, they come from all over the country to do it. So it's pretty exciting. It's fun. Okay, gang. Right. Well, I'm going to uh, go uh, watch a little bit of the Olympics <laughs> and uh, hope for our um, USA team. Thank you so, so much. You're welcome. Thank Good you. luck with your macro photography. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. All right, guys. Good to see everybody. Anything else before we sign off? Don't forget that photo uh, display down in Cle in Cincinnati. Uh, photo display in Cincinnati. At the, uh, oh, where was oh, it? Oh, the art museum. Yes, you yeah. said, you said yeah. that. Yeah, yeah uh, apparently there's a photography exhibition. If some of you came in later, didn't hear that, down at the um, Cincinnati Art Museum that's starting, I think you said today or tomorrow. So it should be there for a while. Uh, so check it out. Gosh, I, I was saying at the beginning, Kathy and myself and another woman, Sue King, we were down in Cincinnati. Gosh, Kathy, that was two years ago now. It's hard to believe. Um, yeah. And we were down there for another reason, but uh, went to the Cincinnati Art Museum because there was a John Audubon um, exhibit there at the time. And it's an incredible museum. It really is. So, you know, not a long drive. I highly recommend it. So you could probably go to the website and find out exactly what the exhibit's about. So there's some good stuff going on, guys. If anybody else uh -huh. has anything too, be sure and email it. I know there's been some good emails going around. Somebody going to say something? Yeah, Donna, hi. This is Dennis Lombardi, the Milk and Mind Meld question guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm new to the club. I'm not uh -huh. particularly new to photography. Uh -huh. I rejoined the club because I wanted to go into the masochistic world of macro photography. Cool. And I just wanted to thank you and the rest of your group for such an incredible presentation by Mike. Um, it was wonderful. I mean, it was more than worth three times the annual fee for the club. Oh, that's um, cool. And I'm just looking to get a little bit more active as time goes on very slowly. But I just wanted to thank you and the rest of the educational group for the great programs you put on. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And you know, you can thank our education committee and Kathy um, arranged for Mike tonight, which was awesome. And Roberta and uh, Pon, Pon occasion me, not that often, but um, but those guys are really just, and Sue Day now who will be helping out too. So I so appreciate that comment. Thank you. And we're really, really, really trying to, you know, I don't want to say branch out, but I guess Zoom has given us the opportunity to branch out and to, to really bring more individuals uh, into the club to present and, and kind of reach our, you know, reach further out into there. So I'm really glad you enjoyed it. I really am. I'm back. I'm so glad you're back. 
Totally. I feel like a novice among pros, but I'll, I'll catch up sooner or later, at least a little bit, maybe. Yeah, but thank you so much. It's, a, it's been <laughs> wonderful. Thank yeah, you. So I glad. wanted to second that, too. Thank you. <laughs> you don't hear that much about those types of things. So thanks. You don't. For saying that. You don't. Thank you very much for that. I was glad to hear you say he shoots at F-32 because I shot my Nikon at F-45. Have you really? Yeah. Wow. You have the yeah, A-50, the is... don't you? Huh? Which, which Nikon do you have right now? The A-50? I've got the, well, no, I moved to the Z7. Oh, you got the Z7. Z7. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I've got you the do... new Nikon 105 macro. Yeah. Um, but the previous, the F version would shoot at F-45. They have a brand new 105 now? Yeah. When did that come out? When did that uh, come out? I got mine. It was hard to get. I got mine about a, two months ago. Oh, really? Is yeah, it a Z? It just came out. Is it a Z mount or an F mount? Is it a Z mount? It's a Z mount. Z -mount. S mount. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, cool. it's beautiful. But yeah, it, it maxes out. I think the new one maxes out at F45 also. Oh, wow. Which is really nice because the Tamron version is F32, like you mentioned in the presentation. Very cool. I'd love to try that sometime. I, <laughs> you know, mine goes to what? I can get to F32 on some, but mostly F28. Yeah, and it's, you've got to be at like the closest focusing distance to get to F45. Okay. okay. If you're shooting like more of a portrait range, it, I think it maxes at F32. Okay, okay. But it does go up to F45 in some cases. Cool, wow. Yeah, yeah I, I actually liked how he pointed out about, not using the focus stacking. And it's a reminder that you can get that by adjusting certain things and just moving things around. I like that he that he pointed that out and showed his images, you know, mm. of how he did that. I thought that was well, I liked how he mentioned that he actually hung the pine cone himself. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't on a tree. Yeah. <laughs> he took the pine cone and hung it in front of the tree so he could move it as far away as he wanted to. Yeah. To get exactly. I, I wouldn't have necessarily thought of that, you know, because yeah. like you're gonna normally try to shoot the natural subject as it is in nature. Uh huh. But doing it that way and hanging it yourself or putting the background yeah. behind it that you printed. Yeah. Those are both really great suggestions to to help exactly. get you know, images that are really hard to get otherwise. You're yeah, you're right. And um, just to branch off a little bit from the macro. Um, and I'll, I'll email it out. I'm pretty sure it's called the Photo Club and it's on YouTube. And this guy is real, he takes some gorgeous shots and they're all in his studio, but he goes into great detail on how he sets them up and then how he does the lighting and all of that. It's a really cool YouTube channel. Um, and even, you know, and it goes to macro, it goes to anything, whether you, I would assume you're out in the field, but also in the studio. And, um, and it's really cool the way he goes through it. And it's in quite a bit of detail. So you guys might want to check it out on YouTube. I've gotten into YouTube, like I spend all my time on YouTube anymore. I'm getting rid of all my other stuff, I think. <laughs> what, what's the name of that, Donna? I'm watching. almost positive it's called the Photography Club. Um, I'll double check it and I'll email it out tomorrow just okay, to make thanks. sure um, if that's incorrect. But I'm also, I'm almost positive it's called the Photography Club. And I can't remember the guy's name, um, but, but he's got a ton of them out there and it's really cool to see how he sets these things up, kind of to make things look like they're floating and to make things... Uh, look like they're just doing all of these incredible stuff, plus some some very beautiful macro shots. Um, so and and you know and lighting, the lighting can be doesn't have to be sophisticated at all. He shows you how to do standard um, uh, strobes or whatever, you know. So uh, you can even use lamps. Uh, so uh, they're pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Donna, if you're just now getting into YouTube. I'm convinced that somewhere on YouTube is a do-it-yourself at-home heart transplant. <laughs> You're right. <I> probably. <laughs> no, I agree. You can. There's so much stuff out there. It's amazing. It it's is. Amazing. It yeah. is. And I'll have this on YouTube. I will try and get that in the last one. I'm sorry. I forgot to put the last one on, you guys. But I'll try and get this on um, tomorrow. I have a pretty open day tomorrow, and I'll do it real quick tomorrow morning. So anybody who wants to go back and watch it. 
okay? And it'll be on YouTube. You are aware we have our YouTube channel, don't forget that. So all the things we did all last year and up until the last one are all on there, all our presentations, okay? So it's Westbridge Camera Club and it's on YouTube. All right. Okay, guys. Wonderful to see everybody. See you in, well, Bye. hopefully maybe next Tuesday. So those of you, hopefully we'll see you next Tuesday. Come and see everybody in person. Good night, everybody. Good night.